As you listen to the prelude played by Josh Harrington and Beverly Posomas, you're invited to reflect on the following meditation, which is an excerpt from the Meditations of the Heart by Howard Thurman, an African-American scholar, writer, theologian, and friend of Greenwood's Benjamin Mays. It is in order to think about children and our relationship to them, often we underestimate both our influence and our responsibility with reference to children because they do not seem to be mindful of our presence except in terms of something to resist. It is not important whether the child is able to comprehend the words we use or understand the ideas we articulate. The child draws his or her meaning from the meaning we do put into things that we do and say. Let us not be deceived. We may incorporate in our formal planning all kinds of ideas for the benefit of our children. We may provide them with tools of various kinds, but if there is not a genuineness in our climate, if the little ways we regard them as a nuisance, as irritations, as things in the way of our pursuits, they will know that we do not love them and our religion will not be authentic for them. Therefore, let us gather around our children and give them the security that can come only from associating with adults who mean what they say and do what they say. Our call to worship this Father's Day comes from Psalm 1. 
Blessed is the man who walks and does not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit at the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law does he meditate day and night. And he should be like trees planted by the streams of water, which yield his fruit in his season, and his leaf does not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. The wicked are not so, but like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Hear now our invocation. Loving Father, we come before you today humbled and in awe of your grace and mercy. Thank you for those who serve as fathers, whether biological or by association. Thank you for those who have loved us and sheltered us, challenged and inspired us. Thank you for those who gave us life. Thank you for those who played with us struggled with us, helped us find our calling in life, and showed us how to be people of strength and gentleness. Thank you for those who taught us your will and your word. Thank you for those who continue to encourage us in our faith. Thank you for their influence in our lives. And thank you for providing us the ultimate example of love through your Son, our Savior. Amen. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. Today is the third Sunday after Pentecost. Today is also Father's Day, a day in which First Baptist recognizes the importance of the family. We're grateful you have chosen to worship with us through our website, Facebook page, or our YouTube channel. As we continue to worship remotely, we encourage you to stay connected through our various emails and updates with our church website at fbcgwd.org. The New Testament lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, I invite you to open a Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11 as Cooper Ann White comes to read our scripture lesson. Ask and you will receive, search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened for you. Everyone who asks will receive, everyone who searches will find, and the door will be opened for everyone who knocks. Would any of you give, a hung give your hungry child a stone if the child asks for some bread would any of you give the, the child snake your child a snake if the child asks for a fish as bad as you are still know how to give good gifts to your children but your heavenly father is even more ready to give good things to people who ask this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of worship and affirmation on this Father's Day Sunday is found in our hymnals, hymn number 686, God Made from One Blood. As you see the text on the screen, I invite you to sing with all of us together.
God is generous and calls us to the practice of generosity as well. So today we have a time to offer thanks for God's faithfulness to us and ask God's blessing on our faithfulness as we serve and give. Our offertory prayer today was written by Deacon Scott White. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather together on this Father's Day, we are reminded of the many lessons our fathers, grandfathers, uncles, and other fatherly figures have taught us. We are thankful for the positive influence they have had on our lives, and we are grateful for the many ways they have shaped who we are and who we will become. We come to you today, Lord, during a tumultuous time in our community, nation, and world. Our communities are being ripped apart by a lack of acceptance, tolerance, and understanding. Lord, you are our Heavenly Father, and you have taught us the greatest lesson of all, to love your neighbor as yourself. You have shown us how to be a parent, God, as you have continually done with us, let us have patience with one another, provide strength and comfort to those who are hurting, and above all else, Lord, help us to show compassion and love toward each other. We now ask that you take these tithes and offerings and use them to the betterment of our community, our nation, and your kingdom. Help us to open our hearts and give generously, as you have so generously given to us. Thank you, God, for always listening to the prayers of your children, including the prayers that we offer now in silence. Finally, we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
invite you to open a Bible. If you have a conventional Bible or use a Bible on your phone or your tablet, open it to Deuteronomy 6. The words of Moses just before the Israelites enter into the promised land. Deuteronomy 6, we're going to begin our Old Testament lesson in verse 20. When your children ask you in the time to come, what is the meaning of the decrees and the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your children, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land that he promised on oath to our ancestors. Then the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our lasting good, to keep us alive, as is now the case. If we diligently observe the entire commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, we will be in the right. This is the word of God for our time and our lives. Thanks be to God. On Mother's Day, we talked about some of the similarities between the church and the family. We said that there is a significant shared vocabulary, the language of God as father or mother, the language of believers as daughters and sons of God and sisters and brothers in Christ. We also said on Mother's Day that both the family and the church are places where adults teach children, although that can be challenging. It can be a challenge to be consistent in the messages we send to children. I heard someone say that we spend the first two years of our children's lives trying to get them to walk and talk, and then we spend the next ten years trying to get them to sit down and be quiet. Really, what we're trying to teach our children in our families and in our churches is Christian values and priorities, which is what this morning's text is about. The context for Deuteronomy 6 is that the Israelites are about to enter into the promised land, and God is giving them some rules, some laws, which apply to the community of faith, what we would call the church, and which apply to individuals and families. The first part of the chapter, which we read on Mother's Day, emphasizes, one, loving God, and two, obeying God. The latter part of the chapter, which we read this morning, offers two additional guidelines which apply to the community of faith and to the family. First, God says, insofar as possible, obedience should be accompanied by understanding. Don't just teach children in the family and in the church to obey God, but teach them to understand God and to know God. In this text, God says, There will come a time when your children will ask you, What is the meaning of the laws and statutes which the Lord has commanded us? When they do, God says, You shall tell them the stories of how you were slaves in Egypt, 
And I, the Lord, delivered you with a mighty hand and brought you into a land flowing with milk and honey. God says, tell the children the stories. Tell them the stories of the Exodus so they will know that God wants us to be free. Tell them the stories of the land flowing with milk and honey so they will know that God wants to provide for us. Tell them the stories of the covenant with Abraham so they will know that God wants to have a relationship with us. Tell the children the stories. Isn't this what we do in the family and in the church? How many times have I told a story or started to tell a story only to have my children say, Dad, you've told that story a hundred times and they were not far wrong. A children's Sunday school class was studying the creation, how God made all of the plants and all of the animals. The teacher asked the children, what is small and gray and furry and has a bushy tail and likes to eat nuts? And a child said, well, I know the answer must be Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel. That child had already learned that the church is a place that he could expect to hear stories about Jesus. We tell stories about Jesus. We tell stories about what God has done for God's people because they help us and our children understand God and know God. Second, in the family and in the church, teach children that God's rules are for the good of those who are called to obey them. Verse 24 in this morning's text says, The Lord commanded us to observe these statutes for our lasting good. You could translate that last phrase, for our good always. In his book, Front Porch Tales, Philip Gully tells about something that happened at a Pee Wee League baseball game in his community. In this league, the fathers take turns being umpires. When it's his turn, each dad takes a solemn vow to be objective and impartial, and you can bet the other parents hold him to it. In this particular game, the home plate umpire's five-year-old daughter, Robin, comes up to the plate. The umpire, Mr. Objective, Mr. I don't have any children, so don't expect any favors from me, watches as his little girl knocks the dirt out of her cleats, just like the big leaguers. He knows that she's never had a hit in a game, and he knows how badly she wants to have one. He weakens and from behind his mask whispers encouragement to her. Come on, honey, you can do it. Just watch the ball. Remember what I taught you. And then it happens. The ball pings off the bat and trickles down the third base line. The man in the mask is no longer an umpire. He's a father jumping up and down and yelling, run, honey, run. And run she does from home plate straight to the pitcher's mound and from there straight to second base where she stops and gives high fives to everyone she can find, including the shortstop and second baseman of the other team and including her teammate, who has arrived at second base from first base. Dad suddenly remembers that he's the umpire. 
He stops jumping up and down and tries to paste a look of objectivity on his face. There's a conference at home plate and dad the umpire walks solemnly to second base, calls his little slugger out and sends her back to the dugout. Why does he do this? It's not because he doesn't share her excitement. He's probably more excited than she is. It's not because he wants to rain on her parade or keep her from having fun. It's because he wants her to learn about fairness and doing the right thing. He wants her to learn that the rules are for everyone's good including hers, and therefore the rules should be followed by everyone, including her. This is what the Bible says, that God's rules are for the good of all of God's children. Worship only the living God. Treat others with justice and mercy and kindness. Don't be greedy. Don't be self-centered. Love the Lord with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. These rules are for the good of all of God's children, including us, and therefore they should be obeyed by all of God's children including us. At the heart of this principle is the most important lesson that we can teach the children in our families and in our church. God's love has no limit and no condition. In the book Chicken Soup for the Mother's Soul, Kathleen Lukens tells about her special child and her special friend, Marie. Kathleen and Marie both have a son who is rather severely disabled and who is the fourth of five children. Out of this coincidental similarity, they forged a friendship which included both the joys and the challenges of caring for a child with special needs. One day, quite unexpectedly, Marie announced that she was taking her son Billy to Lourdes, the cathedral in France, whose waters are purported by some to have miraculous healing power. It would be a difficult trip. Billy was seven years old, but he was less predictable and more dependent than most seven-year-olds. Marie didn't speak a word of French. What's more, both Marie and Kathleen agreed that the chances of Billy being cured were very slim. Still, Marie seemed to feel that she owed it to Billy to try. Kathleen said almost before she had time to notice she was gone, Marie was back from her trip and with a new spring in her step a new vitality in the way she cared for Billy and the way she cared for the rest of her family and friends. She seemed to have greater peace, more patience. Billy, on the other hand, seemed completely unchanged. Kathleen kept expecting Marie to tell her about the trip when she didn't, Kathleen decided that whatever had happened must have been a personal and private experience. One day, Kathleen stopped by Marie's house. Marie disappeared momentarily and returned with a small bottle. She said, I brought you some water from Lourdes. Kathleen looked puzzled. Do you think it helped, Billy? You don't understand, Marie said. I didn't put Billy in the water. What do you mean you didn't put him in the water? Marie said, when it came time, 
I just couldn't do it. Kathleen's question came out in a whisper. Why? Because I love Billy just the way he is. Even if he will never be what I dreamed he would be, I still love him. This is what we need to teach the children in our families and in our church. And what we need to remember ourselves, even if we never become what God dreamed we would be, God still loves us. Would you pray together with me? How grateful we are, O oh God, for your unconditional love. In recent days, we have been reminded of our frailty and mortality, how susceptible we are to sickness and loneliness and fear, and yet you love us. We have been reminded that we have not fulfilled your dream for us. Your dream that all people would know your love. Your dream that your church would wholeheartedly embrace justice for those whom society marginalizes. And as individual persons, our frequent failures, our personal sins in what we do and what we fail to do remind us that we have not fulfilled your dream for us. And yet, you love us. Create in our hearts and minds a willingness to be transformed by your love. To grow into your dream and to build your kingdom here and now. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now as you go, or as you stay, know that the God who created you is constantly at work for good in your life. Know that Jesus Christ, who has redeemed you by his love, walks beside you each day. And know that God's Holy Spirit even in these unusual days, is empowering you to share the great love of our God. Amen.